I'm Richard Holcomb. I'm most well known in the area and have spent most of my speaking engagements in the realm of technology. I left technology a few years ago, and one of the things that's not particularly well known about me, at least not until recently, is that I'm really just an Eastern North Carolina farm boy. I didn't grow up as handsome as I, as I started out. The other thing that not many people know about me, if any of y'all know, you know people my age or older that were farmers, lots of times you hear stories about, why well, I couldn't wait to leave the farm. Well, not me. I loved farming. I loved it as a kid. I loved it as a, as a teenager. I loved it as a young adult. It was fantastic. I liked getting my hands dirty. I liked touching the soil. I liked playing with the chickens. Uh, I don't throw eggs at people, but uh, <laughs> you know, I just, I just liked the whole thing. But now it's going to be technology. But as I was uh, coming of age, getting out of high school, agriculture was changing. This uh, handsome young man here is named Earl Butts. He was the Secretary of Agriculture for the Nixon administration and uh, the Ford administration. And he's very famous for the phrase that's on the slide, get big or get out. That was the mantra of agriculture in the, in the 70s. I was a poor farm kid. I didn't have any ability to get big, so I got out. Uh, and did what most poor farm kids do from from Eastern North Carolina, I came to NC State, I got a master's degree in computer science, I started a few companies, you know, sold them, did some investing, won a few awards, and then started a few restaurants. You know, pretty typical rags to riches and back kind of story. Uh, but in that same period of time when I was doing that, and reaching the point where I was getting a little bit tired of the technology area, and more importantly, noticing that my children didn't have the life experience that I did growing up. Now, most people would consider my children's childhood compared to my childhood as privileged. Big house, big cars, nannies, uh, lots of places to go and do things, lots of traveling. But what I saw as they became young teens was that all they really liked to do was watch TV, play video games, fight with each other. They won't go outside. There were kids in the neighborhood, but all those kids went to different schools, right? Uh, and I made the decision in my early 40s that, okay, I would try moving the kids back to the farm just on weekends. So I bought a farm out in the country, moved the kids out there on the weekends, and after a couple of weekends, the kids came to me and went, I said, Daddy, why exactly is it that we have to go back to Rob? I mean, out here we have anything you could possibly want. Now, and parents won't believe this. It was a, story in one of the magazines a few months ago that I got a lot of feedback on it that I was lying. My kids don't fight anymore, all right? They're outside, they're playing, they're doing farm work, they're doing things with animals. So I decided to move back to the farm and away from, from technology. But farming really did get big. It grew tremendously in scale while I was off playing with computers. And I was actually kind of surprised, not only did it get big, the whole, the whole system changed. Big to me implied scale. You know, if you'd asked me when I was 17, you know, should I get big as a farmer, that would have meant the 100 acre farm that I was used to would have needed to become a 1,000 acre farm. Sorry. Um, and that happened. But the other thing that happened was that farming became industrial rather than natural. A real common and classic example. Historically, for thousands of years, farms have been raising crops, but those crops were eaten by animals, and those animals have a waste product. You all know what that is. And that waste product was used to fertilize the crops, and it was a closed loop. It was nature. It worked. But somewhere along the way, getting big, somebody decided to optimize the system. So it really isn't that efficient, if you're thinking in an industrial way, that I have a whole bunch of little farms, each raising a few cows, a few chickens, a few goats, a few crops. It would be way more efficient if if this farmer just raised pigs, and if this farmer just raised cows, and if this one just raised sheep, and this one just raised chicken, and these guys over here just raised corn, soybeans, and everything else. And it would even be more efficient if those farms got really, really big. And certain land in this country is probably better suited for growing corn, and other lands better suited for growing hogs. So let's put the hog farms where the hog farms will do well, and the corn farms where the corn farms will do well, and let's get them, let's get them as big as they can be. Now, from a from an industrial perspective, from a businessman perspective, that all makes sense to me, right? But it leaves out one big key question. What about the shit, right? <laughs> so, 
Now in eastern North Carolina, I've got hog farms with thousands and thousands and thousands of hogs and no crops. Well, what used to be manure that was fertilizer for crops is now toxic waste. It's filling great big hog pollutants. Every time it rains too much, those overflow into the river. It's a massive environmental problem. The state of North Carolina spends millions of dollars every year trying to figure out the manure problem. Well, through thousands of years of agriculture, we never had a manure problem. We've only had a manure problem in the last you know, 20 years. Well, what's the other side of that? Well, now I've got guys out in the Midwest growing corn and soybeans. Ooh, but they're not growing hogs, at least not on the same farms. So they don't have manure as fertilizer. So what do they do? Well, they call up the Middle East and order a whole bunch of oil. And then we turn that oil into chemical fertilizers and we spray that on the soil. So now we've taken a very natural system of plants to animals to manure back to plants and turned it into a completely broken industrial system with a lot of dependent problems. And I'm just going to show you some pictures of these problems. Now these are cows. These are milk cows. Now another function of the industrial age, how many people in this room, you have to raise your hand, but almost nobody in this room, I've actually had a conversation with people out in the hallway, would drink unpasteurized milk. It's bad for you. It's not healthy, right? Well, what is pasteurization? Technically, it's raising the temperature of something to 180 degrees for a few minutes, and it kills the microbes in the soil. How many of you that are parents, you know, have pasteurized mother's milk on the way to your child? God, that sounds stupid, right? Well, then, why would we pasteurize milk coming from a cow that we're drinking? That's because the milk's unsafe. Well, if the milk coming from a mother to a child is unsafe, why would the milk from these cows be unsafe? Well, the milk from these cows are unsafe is because, you know, nature never intended cows to live this way. They're living in a barn, on concrete, fed grain, which is not the natural thing that a cow eats. These cows are sick. Sick cows produce sick milk. Now, in a natural environment, you would look at that and say, hmm, Let's not do it that way. Because producing bad milk would be bad for the people drinking it. In an industrial environment, you look for the cheapest way to fix it. Oh, so the milk's bad. Boil it. Hey, move on. Beef. This is where your hamburger comes from. Now, if you go and look at packages of hamburger in the grocery store, you will find pictures of very, very pretty farms. You will never see this picture. This is where 99% of the beef comes from. Feed lots out in the Midwest, animals jammed together on top of each other, knee deep in their own shit, uh, and they're full of, fit full of uh, antibiotics, hormones, you know, what it takes to keep them alive because these, these animals are also sick. So, sick animals could potentially produce bad and healthy meat. Well, you can't pasteurize meat, that would be cooking it. Mm, that wouldn't look good. I got an idea. There are certain chemicals, like ammonia, that will kill stuff in meat. So 80% of the ground beef supply in this country now is doused with ammonia before you eat it. Again, perfectly logical industrial response to an industrial problem. But you know, farming shouldn't be industrial. I don't, uh, I don't add any ammonia in my meat. And I doubt if you were at home and you saw a piece of meat on the plate, you would look at that and go, you know what? I cleaned the bathroom yesterday. <laughs> and it's, mm, it just smells fresh and clean now. It's got a nice scent of uh, lemon ammonia in it. I think I'll add a little bit of that into the ground beef. You would never do it. But corporate America, corporate agriculture, factory farming, that's exactly what they're doing. And when you go to the grocery store and buy the pretty package, that's what you're buying, that's what you're eating. These are pigs, same deal. Kept in a barn, uh, ventilation systems. These are your chickens, not the chicken you saw earlier. This is the way the commercial chickens are raised. Uh, these are your nuggets. Same deal, these chickens are not healthy. If the power goes off in this building for more than just a few hours, the majority of the birds will die. Because if they don't get the, the medicine that they need, if they don't get the ventilation, if they don't get the other things that man is providing for them in this fake environment, the chickens won't live. But in six weeks from egg, to this stage, you will eat them as a nugget. These are where your eggs are coming from. We like to call these the salmonella fecal eggs. <laughs> but there's a better way. And the better way is really not that hard to imagine. I mean, we've screwed it up really bad in the last 30, 40, 50 years. We can fix it. 
All we need to do is go back. This is what vegetables look like on a non-factory farm. Actually, this looks a lot like the pictures on the shrink wrap packages of the factory food you buy in the grocery store. Uh, but this is a real picture of vegetables at my farm. Um, these are my containment operations. I use the sheep to keep up with the chickens. The chickens keep up with the sheep. If anybody does anything they're not supposed to do, they tell me. <laughs> um, I have a very sophisticated guard system. Actually, if you go by any of the factory farms today, you think you're entering Fort Knox. Great big signs of do not enter, you will be shot. Uh, kind of things, because for several reasons. If you go to these places, and you can catch the germs and the stuff that are on them, if you go to another one, you're a disease vector to the other factory farms. But more importantly, especially now that Cell phones have cameras. The last thing they want is more pictures like the ones I just showed you earlier with the names underneath them. Of, this is what the chickens look like at so-and-so farm. So the, the modern factory farms are more like Fort Knox. But anyway, a little white dog there, big white dog, is my only security system. He's actually pretty friendly. These are the chickens. They got out of the factory environment and they found some grass, which they really seem to like. Um, this is my idea of you know, of a fine animal operation for, uh, for beef and dairy. This is Eudora, where we get all our milk from. And she has, she lives with her beef cow friends, which is where we get all of our beef from. And again, more pictures of vegetables. So, yeah, I've shown some shocking pictures just before lunch. Oh, um, but it's not just about how the animals are raised. It, it's about the whole system. So, back in 1940, which is pretty much the same way that I'm farming today. My equipment dates from about 1940. Um, it took one calorie of energy to produce 2.3 calories of food. Not a bad system, right? Today, in the modern farming system, it takes 10 calories of energy to produce one calorie of food. Where did that energy come from? It largely came from the Middle East. And what is the cost of maintaining oil at prices low enough that we can use it to create fertilizer, and use it to ship product from the West Coast, from the Midwest, to here. Healthcare. Maybe it's just a coincidence, but I don't think so. So healthcare costs in this country have risen from 5% of GDP to 16% of GDP, and no matter what your opinion is on, is on Obamacare, it's going to keep going up. Four of the most uh, killing diseases in this country now are dietary diseases. Stroke, type 2 diabetes, cancer, and heart disease. We are killing ourselves, and we are destroying our environment, and we are funding the terrorists who want to blow us up by eating factory food. The biggest comment I get back from people is, well, okay, Richard, that's nice. So you and your yuppie friends can eat your expensive organic food, but you can't treat the world this way, and you can't expect the whole country to pay you know, prices of organic foods versus the stuff that you can the factory food that you're buying at the grocery store. The only reason the factory food at the grocery store is cheaper than the organic food that's raised on the farmer who lives next door to you is because the real cost of that factory food is not built into the cost of that's being charged at the supermarket. The U.S. taxpayer, the U.S. military, and just the environment in general are underwriting a huge amount of that cost. The pollution of factory food is just, especially in North Carolina with the, with the hog farms, it's just you know, extremely well documented. I don't need to go into it. Uh, farming, factory farming is one of the major causes of, of increased carbon. And we, we've all been inundated with stories about how carbon increases, raising our temperatures and destroying the world. Water. We don't know this so much here because we tend to get rain. The vast majority of the factory crops come from places where it does not rain. Right? Because rain interferes with factory farming. Think about it. If you get any other kind of factory setting, you want your factory process to occur on a certain schedule. The last thing you want is for you know, one of the robots that's doing the welding to decide all, all on its own that it ought to weld something down. Right? Well, if it rains, then it really screws up your watering schedule. So it's far more efficient from a factory perspective to pump water out of the ground or take water from the mountains and spray the desert and grow stuff in the desert. Now, it's idiotic from a perspective of we're running out of water, but the vast majority of water use on the West Coast goes to agriculture. 
health care, we've already talked about the farm bill. Farm bill is a government thing, but 40% of the cost of all uh, agriculture, 40% of the revenue to factory farms comes directly from the United States government. It comes directly from your pocket. So you're already paying in the form of raised taxes um, for, the, for the factory food that, that's being delivered to the grocery store. And then how do you, how do you calculate the cost in dollars or in soldiers' lives of the military effort? that's required worldwide to keep petroleum flowing from this country to be used for things as silly as shipping lents in California to a store in North Carolina. $200 hamburger? Yeah, maybe. $100 hamburger? If you pay the real cost, then it really uh, puts things in perspective. The other argument that we get from, uh, particularly from the ad people, is that, well, that's great, but you really can't feed the world this way. I mean, you're just, you're just playing around with this, you're feeding a few people on the side. So the data is completely opposed to that. Rodale Institute is one of the main organizations up north that's been doing research in organic farming for the last 50 years. They are the founders of the Organic Gardening magazine, if any of y'all have ever looked or seen that. And here's their 22-year farming trial data. Organic farming produced the same yields of corn and soybeans. Now, corn and soybeans are probably two of the crops you need to grow the far less of, but even you know, comparing those commodity-type crops, they produce the exact same yields uh, using organic methods as they did conventional methods. And these methods were 30% less energy, less water, and no petrochemicals were used at all. These results are 50% greater than the world average. So if we really moved to an organic food system, to a local food system, not only could we feed the world, we could feed the world on half the space that we're currently farming. So my final uh, message here again, sorry, just before lunch, I didn't know when they were going to schedule me as you know, the choice is really yours. Um, there's two ways as Americans that we have affected the outcome of things. One is voting, that's coming up, I'll leave that alone. Um, and the other is every day, when you pull out that credit card. All right? You pull out your, your wallet. What are you buying? You buying Coke, and McNuggets, and you know, food from, uh, from chain grocery stores that are you know, nicely packaged, but sprayed with, sprayed with ammonia so that it's out. Or, there's farmers markets, there's CSAs, which are subscription-based buying, there's, uh, particularly in this area, sustainable retailers, sustainable restaurants like mine, uh, and there's just the idea of knowing your farmer. You know, uh, someone made the observation to me the other day that anytime they choose a babysitter, they just really check that babysitter out, which you would expect. A parent uh, would, would recommend doing that. But then they have no idea what their food is. Well, they're feeding the baby this food. You know, don't you owe it to your own health and to the environment and to your children and everything else to actually have some idea and at least make a conscious choice. You may consciously decide that yeah, I don't care about the environment. I don't care about anything. I want cheap food. Okay? But most people I think make these decisions not thinking. And anyone that I've ever taken past or near or by one of these factory farming operations decides they won't do that again. Right? Thank you.